Welcome, market participants, to another Three Things in Credit. I'm Van Hesser, Chief Strategist at KBRA. Each week, we bring you three things impacting credit markets that we think you should know about. Sentiment has taken a turn for the worse, which we warned you about a couple of months ago, and it's weighing on you. One strategist summed it up this way. Macro uncertainty is incredibly high. People have no idea what 2024 looks like, from inflation to the labor market to geopolitics or political dysfunction. You know what I think? Probably not a listener to three things in credit. That's what I think. Anyway, this week, our three things are, one, Middle East and oil. We'll provide some useful context. Two, regional banks. Jay Powell says the business model is under pressure. We'll have a look. And three, small caps. They're really important to credit. We'll tell you why. All right, let's dig a bit deeper. Middle East and oil. We often remind market participants that geopolitical events in and of themselves tend not to impact markets, except when one or two things happen as a result. One, the event materially alters supply and demand, typically of an important commodity. And two, when the event escalates. When we think about the market impact of developments in the Middle East, we note that the commodity complex hasn't changed all that much, including oil, which is up only 2% since October 6th. However, the situation in the Middle East potentially meets both of our criteria. Courtesy of the World Bank's most recent commodity markets outlook, we know that the region holds 48% of proven crude reserves and accounts for about a third of world production, and that 20% of global crude supply flows through the Strait of Hormuz. So the prospect of disruption should catch your attention. We also know that past conflicts in the region have resulted in the kind of oil shocks that have played a significant role in economic downturns. In 1973, the Arab oil embargo saw prices quadruple in five months. That triggered a recession. The Iranian Revolution, beginning in late 1978, saw prices double in six months. And the Iran-Iraq War, beginning in 1980, saw prices rise 20% in two months. Both of those events contributed to the 1980 recession. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait caused prices to double in two months of 1990. A recession soon followed. You see a pattern here. Now, the report does point out how the oil market has changed since those events, mentioning things like reduced oil dependence, the creation of strategic reserves, and diversification of supply sources. But, safe to say, markets did not respond well to Middle East conflicts. As for escalation, the World Bank warns that the conflict could result in substantial energy supply disruptions, posing a major risk to its baseline projection of $81 a barrel on average in 2024. The bank lays out three scenarios, small, medium, and large disruptions. A small disruption affecting less than 2% of global production would result in an increase of $3 to $12 a barrel above 2023's Q4 baseline, of $90 a barrel, so $93 to $102 a barrel oil. A medium disruption, 3 to 5% of global production, would result in prices of $109 to $121 a barrel, while a large disruption, 6 to 8% of global production, would see prices of $140 to $157 a barrel. The economic impact of all of this, obviously, depends on the particulars, including length of the spike and the second-order effects on other commodities and political responses. But, safe to say, that current risk market valuations would be vulnerable to something in the World Bank's medium-to-large scenarios. With visibility as low as any event I can remember as to how this plays out, it argues for remaining up in quality until we get a better sense as to how this can be resolved. On that note, let's move on to our second thing, regional banks. While just about everyone agrees, ourselves included, that the so-called March events, i.e. the high-profile failures of three good-sized American banks and Credit Suisse, were highly idiosyncratic events. Still, concern remains out there among some that there is something fundamentally wrong with smaller than the largest U.S. banks. Case in point, we attended Fed Chair Powell's Economic Club address a couple of weeks ago, where he was asked about the importance of regional banks to the U.S. financial system. While acknowledging that regional banks are an enormously important part of our banking system, 
he did say that he felt their business model is, quote, under pressure, unquote. I found that comment to be curious. What was he referring to? Well, from our perspective, the regional banking model is working just fine. Providing financial services to households and small to mid-sized businesses in the U.S. is a good business. The market uses a lot of financial services and pays dearly for the privilege. Are there a lot of banks? You bet. The U.S. has deliberately kept its banking system highly decentralized compared to the rest of the developed world, believing that smaller banks serve the financial needs of the all-important small business community, a meaningful engine of economic growth and innovation, not to mention employment. By the numbers, regional banks look just fine. Profitability for the second quarter is actually a touch better than that of the largest banks, and it is at or near historic highs. And there is no evidence that regional banks are having to reach for earnings by taking on undue risk. Are regional banks facing higher funding costs as a result of Mr. Powell's rate hikes at the fastest pace in 40 years? Of course, but casual observers of banks often misinterpret the impact of higher rates. The balance sheets of the vast majority of regional banks are asset-sensitive, meaning that prices of their assets, mostly loans, will reprice faster in a rising rate environment than the cost of their liabilities, mostly deposits. That's good for banks. But wait, say the casual observers. The government's paying 5% on treasury bills. Surely that hurts the banks, which have been paying next to nothing on their deposits forever, it seems. True, but don't confuse the marginal cost with the total cost. A regional bank's funding base does not reprice all the way to the Fed level in one fell swoop. Moreover, the pricing and stickiness of deposits are made up of a myriad of considerations on the part of both the bank and its customers. In Q2, the total cost of funding for regional banks was all of 2.2%. Meanwhile, the yield on those same earning assets was 5.8%. It's a pretty good business model, I would say. By the way, the regional bank margin, the difference between those two, of 3.6%, far exceeded that of the largest banks at 3%. So what do markets think of all of this? Well, the S&P 500 Regional Bank Index has underperformed the S&P Equal Weighted Index by a whopping 18 points since the day Silicon Valley Bank failed. There clearly are a lot of skeptics or casual observers out there. The issues working their way into valuations, as we see them, are what we typically see in banks at this part of the cycle, where economic contraction is looming. More specifically, uncertainty as to where loan losses will peak and what loan growth will be weighs on investors' sentiment. And yes, there is some uncertainty as to how funding cost and stickiness of deposits will play out, as well as the cost of any new regulation. But this is not about the integrity of the business model. That still works. All right, on to our third thing, the importance of small caps. You might not think a lot about small caps in credit. We do from a couple of perspectives. One, their relevance and performance is meaningful in the worlds of mid-market CLOs and private credit. And two, small business is a significant employer. The latter is super important at this point in this cycle because it's not a stretch to say that risk asset valuations are mostly standing on one leg, the tight labor market. Nearly half of the jobs in the U.S. are in the small business sector, and some 63% of net jobs created over the past 30 years have been created by small businesses. Small business make up 40% of private sector payroll. The health of the small business sector in the U.S. is important. So we've talked recently about the underperformance of the Russell 2000. It's down 6% year-to-date and 32% from its cyclical peak back in November of 2021. And that compares to down 4% and 17% respectively for the equal-weighted S&P 500. Here's something else to ponder. 45% of the Russell 2000 companies are unprofitable. That's up from around 30% 10 years ago. Interest coverage in the aggregate for the index is two times compared to 8.4 times for the S&P 500. Here's another thing. Banks are far and away the most important source of financing for small business, cited by about two-thirds of smaller firms. Banks have tightened lending standards to small businesses consistent with an economic shock. So much for a soft landing. The point of all of this is don't lose sight of what's going on in the small business side of the economy. Hit hard by inflation, the rising cost of capital, and limited financing alternatives, 
and facing a corporate sector that for 40 years has been allowed to concentrate, this sector is vulnerable to downturn and the health of the labor market is at stake. So there you have it. Three things in credit. One, Middle East and oil. The risk to credit is not priced in. Two, regional banks. The model works just fine. And three, small caps. Consider the sector's underperformance a warning to creditors. As always, thanks for joining. Don't forget to check in on KBRA.com for our ratings reports and our latest research. We'll see you next week. Hello, listeners. Join me, Van Hesser, KBRA's chief strategist for in-depth conversations with credit experts in my new monthly podcast, Leading Voices in Credit, where I'll interview market professionals on the latest trends in credit markets. That's Leading Voices in Credit with Van Hesser. Subscribe now.